Okay, so um, I'm going to tell you briefly about some very exciting progress in object recognition. So this is the business where you take an image and you want the computer to automatically say what's in it. Okay, now um, what's curious is that a lot, there's been a lot of excitement about one particular type of model. Um, it's in fact a pretty old model that was invented by someone called Jan LeCun, who um, is actually my colleague at NYU. Uh, he was working at AT&T uh, Labs at the time. Uh, and it's a type of neural network. It's a special type of neural network where the connectivity structure is sort of adapted to visual data. Um, you, you essentially put an image in on the left-hand side. It goes through a sequential layers of sort of convolutions and some kind of you know, subsampling operations um, and to produce then a prediction at the output as to what might be in the picture. And the sort of nice thing about these models is you can train them kind of end to end. The, the different layers of the model have parameters that you can adjust on training data. And you can do that by sort of back propagating any mistakes you make back through the network. Uh, recently, about a year ago, uh, at uh, one of the big machine learning conferences, the Toronto Machine Learning Group uh, took one of these models and to a lot of people's surprise, found that they worked extremely well on the latest benchmarks. Now, you might think, well, why you know, didn't people try this before? It really turns out that um, folks, um, you know, the, previously these models um, were trained on fairly small data sets with a few thousand examples, but in the last year or two, some very large data sets have become available, particularly from, you know, the Stanford's had a big initiative where they use crowdsourcing to uh, essentially gather millions of labeled images. So that is where you, for each picture you say what's in it. And, that's very imp and we need that kind of data where you have a grand truth of what's in the object, and what's in the image rather, to uh, train these models. And uh, the Toronto group used this very big labeled data set to train a model that was much bigger than ones that people tried before. So it had you know, millions of parameters, it was, had to run on GPUs for several weeks to actually train effectively, and so on. But they did actually then get you know, really fantastic performance compared to previous things. These are some little examples um, of uh, images that we see. Um, you know, from the, from the test set of this data set, you notice the actual images gathered from the internet, so they tend to have a single object that's fairly uh, centered. Um, the ground truth label is just beneath the image, and then you can see the five top predictions from one of this big model, this big neural network. And you can see that, you know, sometimes the label's a little bit ambiguous, but the responses that the model's giving are pretty reasonable. Um, so, I, you know, if it gets it wrong, perhaps you can sort of understand why perhaps it might have done so. Now, just to sort of quantify this performance, um, this is a little plot here showing, uh, the, uh, showing what um, essentially on the left side you can see, the, um, this, sorry, this is a plot showing you know, some different approaches running on a big benchmark called the ImageNet classification competition. Um, the y-axis is the uh, error rate, so you want this to be as low as possible. Um, the far left bar in red, that's the sort of standard computer vision techniques, which um, I'm just showing one example here, but in practice there are a whole bunch of these in the competition. Um, all within one or two percent of each other, okay? And then in green was this model from the University of Toronto, um, which came along and got a you know, big drop in error rate. So going from about 26% down to about 16% error. Now, you know, this is a big deal because as I say, normally you kind of get gains of maybe one or two percent um, for each, um, you know, in, you know from year on year in these competitions. And then on the um, right-hand side, um, for some reason the labels aren't showing up, but the, those two bars are showing progress in this year's competition, which was in fact um, won by my student Matt Zeeler, who's now doing a startup called Clarify.com. And you can see that the error rates have gone down you know, even further now, so around about sort of 10% performance, 10% um, error on this data set. And so this is a huge jump. We've, you know, the error rates dropped by, you know, over 50, you know, it's over halved. Um, and as a result, a lot of people are really excited because things are starting to work. It actually starts to you know, work on kind of difficult real world examples Whereas the, you know, the performance on, from the traditional techniques in red just really wasn't um, doing anything that we would consider sort of useful in any in sort of industrial setting. Now, um, one other big question that a lot of people had is when you train on these big, these big models, they're very prone to kind of learn the peculiarities of the data set you're training on, and would they actually be useful for sort of you know, new types of image that you might upload? Um, so, you know, our, my, Matt and myself and a few other uh, folks in academia have tried you know, this out, so what we've done is to train the model on this big labeled ImageNet data set and then attempt to try and um, you know, retrain the last little bit of the model on a new data set. And what we discover is that the, the features work very well. That is, that the representation we're learning um, in these big networks seems to transfer to different domains. Okay? So if you can train it on this big data set, but then you could apply it to your Flickr photos or you could apply it to you know, things you've shot with your iPhone and it should all work pretty well. And in this little plot here, what we're showing is just a varying, the, as we increase the number of training examples of the new data set, 
you can see how the performance in blue of the Convnet shoots up very fast, and it can completely um, beats uh, the sort of the existing sort of uh, recognition approaches in red and green. Okay, and with just six examples, you can kind of match the previous state-of-the-art performance. Okay, so. Um, of course, you know, industry is all very excited about this. These models, one nice feature about them as well is they're very fast to deploy at test time. So they're, they're a pain in the neck to train. It takes several weeks. But once you have them trained, they can process you know, hundreds, of images, hundreds of images a second on sort of standard uh, CPUs. And um, as a result, you know, companies like Facebook and Google and Microsoft are all are now deploying these uh, for, very, for a range of kind of you know, image tagging tasks and so on. And in fact, many of the, this architecture that I've, I've been alluding to, this, these convolutional neural nets, um, they, in fact, work also very well for speech recognition, so they're at the heart now of a lot of the speech recognition engines that you use on Siri and things like that. So here's one little example I'm showing. This is, in fact, the face identification system in, um, in Facebook. So they have a sort of a traditional computer vision front end where they kind of align the face using a 3D model, but then they pass it to one of these convolutional networks to determine whether it's, you know, what's the name of the person that um, has been detected. And this thing, um, this network now achieves, you know, pretty close to human performance on the sort of benchmarks that we have, um, that people have built for this kind of task. Um, so these models really uh, sort of have taken computer vision from the sort of academic arena and have, have now placed it firmly in something that's used um, widely in industry. Now, just so these are some more examples from uh, just running some photos I took when I was in Italy recently through the clarify.com demo. These are just uh, some, you know, you can see the kinds of outputs that the network's giving. There's thousands of possible options. In fact, I think there's maybe, you know, 20,000 different classes the network can output. And you're seeing here the sort of top few that come out. And you can see that it's doing a fairly good job. Um, at this stage, it's, of course, just giving a tag to the image. It's not trying to localize in the picture where the objects are. Um, this is another image. So... Um, and then this one over here, this final one is actually quite a challenging one, um, which is essentially uh, an in interior of a cave. Um, you can see the network has got slightly confused. It thinks that that sort of giant stalactite, it looks like the Sagrada Familia, perhaps, in Barcelona. Okay? But the correct answer is actually number three on the list. So it's doing quite well even in this challenging situation. Now, um, these results are pretty good, um, you, um, but I don't think we would, you know, I wouldn't say they were quite human performance at this stage. Um, and the, that's perhaps not surprising because these models, the pro, there's only sort of one direction of processing. The images come in, you apply these operations, and you get, the information flow just goes all the way up from the pixels to some kind of prediction. Now, it, we know, um, although the details aren't quite clear, that you know, humans and monkeys and um, you know, sort of biological vision systems, there's also another pathway, which is what's called top-down, where you sort of hypothesize the existence of you know, an object and then you sort of check to see you know, how the evidence that's coming from your retina kind of agrees with that, okay? So that's a sort of another pathway that's, that is completely absent from these models. And so it's not surprising you know, that therefore you know, we do better at recognition than these things. So what, um, what would be nice is if there's some way of kind of leveling the playing field, we could knock out that top-down pathway in humans, maybe we could then compare the, the sort of bottom-up performance of humans versus the bottom-up performance of these networks. Now, it turns out there's actually a very simple way to do that that doesn't require any kind of invasive thing. All you need to do is just show the image for a very short time, maybe a tenth of a second or something like that. And just the sheer speed of sort of electrical you know, impulse um, transmission in the neurons and so on means there's simply not time to do any sort of sophisticated top-down reasoning. Essentially, then, you revert to kind of bottom-up processing, which is you know, akin to what's going on in these um, computational models. So this is a, a very interesting recent paper by the group at MIT. Well, what they did is to take um, humans and they took some monkeys and the monkeys had electrodes implanted into IT, which is sort of essentially the top of the visual pathway in their brains. And what they did was to show some images to these monkeys and the humans and then also these deep um, models that I've been describing. And what they did, the, you can see at the top there some little examples of the images. So there's sort of seven different categories, um, you know, a natural background with some kind of object synthetically superimposed. Um, they're going to present these images to all three uh, different groups here, the deep learning models, the monkeys, the humans, and they're going to tap off um, the electrode activities out of the monkey's brain and use that as a kind of feature vector they can plug into a standard classifier. And they're going to use, do the same thing with the deep nets where they're going to um, tap off the uh, feature vector just before the classifier in the deep network, and they're going to use the same classifier that they use for the monkeys. So you've got the same images in, same classifier at the top, all you're changing is the sort of the feature representation that the, the monkey's brain's computing or the deep network's computing. And just to sort of run through the results here, so 
Unfortunately, the, I guess the labels aren't showing up. It's quite right. So on the right-hand side, um, we see the human behavior, which um, you can see there's a certain variance. Humans are getting sort of, you know, mid-70s performance because they, they, we've done this rapid presentation format where they're not allowed to use top-down processing, essentially. Okay, and then you can see uh, the two gray bars on the right. Those are, those, the, oh, those are monkeys um, where we're tapping off different parts of their um, visual cortex. So the, on the right side, the, right, the dark gray one, that's at IT. And of course, they can't tap all the millions of neurons there. They can just use a subset. So um, in practice, uh, the, they statistically extrapolate. And you can see that extrapolation sort of agrees fairly well with human performance, which kind of makes sense, because you know, monkeys see about as well as we do. And then in the color bars, we're showing a range of different computer vision um, approaches. And the three ones on the left are, are, are models so which people have tried previously in computer vision. Sorry, the labels aren't showing up. But you can see their performance is fairly rubbish. The red bar is, in fact, the, the Toronto Group's model using this uh, very large convolutional neural net. You can see it's up at sort of very close to the sort of human level performance. And the green bar is the clarify.com system, which improves on the Toronto Group's result. Okay? And you can see that, in this, at least in this purely bottom up mode of processing, our feed forward, it's another way it's called, we're sort of getting fairly close now to sort of human performance, which I think is very encouraging. Of course, you know, we're still not there. We, you know, if you, if you give humans several seconds to scrutinize the image, they'll get very close to 100%, okay? And that's sort of missing from these models at this time. But certainly, we're getting, you know, the models are now working in a sort of useful uh, way, which they just weren't a few years ago. Um, I'll just skip over these, we're out of time. So anyway, there's been lots of exciting progress, essentially, in this field of machine learning and computer vision, um, but there are still quite a few unsolved problems. We just don't know how to learn without labels. That's a real impediment. Um, we don't have any good theoretical understanding of why these models work as well as they do. Okay, so I'll just stop there, and uh, I'd like to thank Matt Zeeler, who um, was responsible for a lot of the work that I was showing, and my colleagues at NYU and Facebook and, and so on. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good job.